And welcome Don't to the Saturday morning wake up call here. This is the Far North Tactical wake up call. The point being that this is a paid program, and you need to know up front that uh, these guys are the ones that are calling the shots. It's uh, Josh and Aaron Bennett. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Don't blame Steve. Sometimes no. they're even the ones calling the show. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a cell phone in here, so you can call ourselves in case we need to. If nobody calls, right. I'll, I'll call in. I want to say good morning to all the good folks out there listening today, Steve. Really? The good, Just the good Americans or all the good No, folks? all the good folks. And then murderers, thieves, crooks, and politicians. Oh, okay. Turn from your wicked ways. Wow. Resign. <laughs> Go get a real job? Wait a second. Resign? I don't care if you live under a bridge. Just quit being a politician. And a crook and a thief and murderer. Those are actually all synonymous in the same word. Are they really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that a statesman was a dead politician, since we need is more statesmen and fewer politicians. Is that right? Uh, that's dangerous. No, well, you know, just 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 calling them oh. to resign is dangerous because now you're 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 dancing on the edge of libel there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Suggesting that they would need to resign, why? That's that's downright. That's but an act of war. What would they do? We uh been that's talking. That's bad for the economy. Go ahead. It's bad for the economy. <laughs> We uh, have been talking about having a new segment on the show, and we ha- we're not quite sure where we're going to put it yet, so we'll just start it off today, and it's going to be called the Piece of Crap Award. Now, most of us have an unfair advantage against politicians, and I'm pretty sure they're going to win almost every week, which I know that's not quite fair, but no, we might we, we might end up having a caller that could, no, probably not. No. That I'll do a politician? No. Nope. No. And if they were actually here, we'd give them a little baggie, a little trophy with a little dog surprise turd. in it. Dog turd, <laughs> doggy do. But since... We need to actually make a statue of that, I think. We haven't had too many politicians knocking down the door to join us on the show, so we'll just give it to them. In By proxy? Yeah. I could give it to you and pretend that you're... So anyways, today, our piece of crap award goes to... Republican Representative Peter King, Mr. Godly Conservative himself. What makes him Mr. Godly Conservative, Josh? Uh, Sean Hannity said so. But anyways, so we have a little clip of why he is going to get the Mr. Piece of Crap Award. So that's why we should be interested in him being the president. Absolutely. And me being in Congress. <laughs> Good talking to you. Hey, thanks a lot. Hello, Mr. King. If Romney becomes president, he's going to inherit President Barack Obama's secret kill list. What should Romney do, and what are your recommendations for that secret kill list that Obama has? Not, forget it. Forget it. I'm not going to What do you mean? It. It's a serious question. Obama has a kill list. It's a huge change of presidential powers that has occurred. And it's because totally of right. It's totally constitutional. It's the it's one right thing I to agree. kill anybody without the due process right of law and have a kill list? Are you, are you kidding me? So are, are you kidding me? Are you? Are, I, I'm just talking to you. I can't believe and you're for question. real. I can't believe you're such a moron. You're, sa- you're saying kill list are okay. Kill the enemy? Absolutely. How do you know they're the enemy without a trial, without finding out they're guilty? We do know. Our CIA does it. We do it because... You know Alawaki, his 16-year-old son was murdered. He was an American Alawaki citizen. Alawaki should have been killing him. His kid was with him. That's the breaks. That's not just breaks. That's horrible. You're a horrible moron. I'm a horrible moron, yeah? I'm a horrible moron, according to Peter King. I don't like the murder of innocent people without the due process of law, and I'm the horrible moron. Meanwhile, he's campaigning and can't even answer a simple question about a kill list. This is ridiculous. Nobody asked these questions. I've been around here for this whole day, and nobody has been asking any of these serious, legitimate questions, and it's pretty ridiculous. It keeps, it keeps playing something out there. He's my hero. Lots of bailout. Give him to Goldman Sachs. Good to see you. People who support me. No, we can shut it off. Okay. It's hard to hear, anyways. So, Peter King, you get our award. Sorry we can't hand it to you in person. Why are you giving him the award? Because he's a piece of crap of the week. We'll, we'll have to get something like... Because he wants like, to kill brown people? What's wrong with You know, that? on the big radio shows where they have someone talking like they're in a big hallway, the piece of crap award, dun, 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 dun. Steve's got such a good radio voice, he could probably do that from where he's sitting. No, I've got a radio face, not a radio voice. <laughs> a big difference there. <laughs> And people need to realize that, don't think that this is just all right just because uh, 
you know, well, it's just the brown people that we kill without due process of law, even though, you know, we kill them. They were American citizens. So what he's saying is that it's okay now, in his mind, to kill American citizens without the due process of law. Isn't that what all the congressmen said when they passed the NDAA? Yeah. And isn't that what Romney said he agreed with, too? So no difference between the two candidates. But don't think it's just for the brownies over there, the brown skin Muslims or whatever you want to call them. Because, you know, he said, uh, when he said, well, Alawaki's uh, 16-year-old son was with him when he died. He goes, oh, his dad was a terrorist. He was with him. That's the breaks. Uh, his, the 16-year-old son was there and got killed, and so was his 17-year-old cousin. That's the breaks. Well, so I guess when uh, Sammy Weaver got shot in the back, mm-hmm. you know, his dad was a big, bad dude. That's and the breaks. That's the breaks. When Vicky Weaver got shot in the face, that, that's the breaks. That's the breaks. And when the uh, kids at Waco got burnt to the ground by the feds, burned alive. <laughs> that's you know, the that, breaks. That's God. the breaks. That's the breaks. Yeah. So that's the people that we clamor to elect to lead. Incidentally, uh, just in terms of the outsourcing or to make sure that people understand that this is a real issue, the the kill list, uh, there's an article in the New York Times from May 29th of this year that goes through the entire policy, how the kill list came to be, who it is that uh, basically it is the liberal law professor himself, Mr. Obama, who Mm -hmm. campaigned against the Iraq war and against torture and then insisted on improving every new name on an ever expanding kill list pouring over the biographies on the terrorist suspects. Uh, one official is calling it a ba- basically baseball cards of unconventional war. So you, you've got this list of names of people, and you basically decide to put them on the kill list if we think they're bad guys. I say we. They. They. Well, I, let me ask you this, Josh. If you saw your dad murdered, if you were there when your dad was murdered, and you found out that the person who did it was, uh, say, a Chinese soldier mm. or a Chinese assassin. Would you want to go to war against the Chinese? Yes. Why? Because they killed my dad. But they're, they didn't. The, the Chinese people didn't do anything to you. The, the I mean, would you be going against the Chinese because you hate their communism? Because well, I you, don't know if the Chinese had um, drones flying over doing drone <clears throat> drone strikes. Would you want to go to war with the Chinese? Well, if the Chinese had foreign, had military bases on in my backyard, you know, if they just went and go ahead and seized one of my favorite fishing holes and put up a military base there, mm. I mean, I, th- I think you see that the, the point that I'm making is that we keep hearing how the reason why the Arabs want to come kill us is because of our great freedoms and because of our democracy and because of our Christianity, when really it can be explained just in simple blood flu- blood feud language. Mm-hmm. You killed my dad. Hello. <laughs> my name is Meningo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare, Prepare to, to die. die. Yep, exactly right. And it's just a, it's a paddle. You're in the canoe with one paddle going around and around and around and never ends. But these no, guys, that's they what they want. They hate us because we're free. To that's kill why. them. Well, I mean, that's I think that's the whole point, is that why do they hate us? Because we've been killing their relatives for, well, it's been at least 100 years. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't think that they like us at all, even before. I mean, there are those, there are the bad ones that believe if you're not a Muslim, then you're an infidel and you should die. There's no doubt about it. But uh, there are also people who call themselves Christians who believe that if you're not a Christian, you deserve to die. Aha. There's also Christians in those other countries that we kill. That's the breaks. That's the breaks. That's the breaks. So do you think if the uh, Muslims had a huge navy that they called the global force for good, <laughs> that we'd all uh, we'd all be OK with that and accept it because they came up with that nice name? Well, as long as it's a global force for good, I mean, who can argue with that, right? I it's mean, really hard to. It doesn't really matter if they are, are flagged under one particular nation. There, it's a global force, and it's it's for good. Well, according to Glenn Beck, we need this global force for good because communists, anarchists, and Muslims are all kind of the same. And at a door 
near you. No yes. doubt. I mean, anarchists are in your backyard. There are anarchists on this very radio program. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I wonder what... I wonder... Oof, man, God must really have this hard time, right? If he's up there checking things out, and he's got Christians in one country, and so-called Christians in another country, and one side's killing the other side, so he's losing people. Which side does he take, I wonder? Well, I mean, you, that's been a question that's gone back to the Middle Ages. I mean, if you think about it, that's one of the one of the reasons why the Treaty of Westphalia was reached. Obviously, America right now, right? No. no. Of course. How do you figure? We're <laughs> the most Christian nation, Steve. <laughs> We prove it every time we drop a bomb. <laughs> we prove it just by the fact that we're winning everywhere. Right. Al-Qa- oh. Al-Qaeda's in retreat, right? Sure. So the winner writes the history books. The winner is the one that God's side, who's on God's side. Well, God doesn't side with losers. That's true. Mm. Hmm. Logically, you're right. So we must be, well, which party's a part? Well, let's see. Boy, that's going to be a hard one. Which, party, which, a hard which party is the party of God? Mm-hmm. Well, actually, technically, in Arabic, Hezbollah means <laughs> yeah. the party of God. Just, so, I mean, if you, if you want to get technical about it, uh, we we really ought to surrender now. Well, the GOP means God's own people. Oh, is that what that means? Mm-hmm. So, and and, and Demo- Democrat, doesn't that have the word demon in it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, de- <laughs> they're, demon, they're demon-cratic over there. That's what right. They, uh, so we got it all figured out. That's not what GOP what? means, isn't it? GOP means Grand Old Party. Oh. That's a, that's a nickname that they came up with to uh, help give it some legitimacy back when it was a fledgling upstart. Back in the uh, Lincoln days? Yeah, back in the Lincoln days. Yeah, we're going to have a program on Lincoln here pretty soon. Oh, boy. We need, I saw this uh, deal on the news somewhere that said that Lincoln right now is the most popular figure in the world. Or in America. People are just clamoring, you know, if only we had good old Abe back. Wow. Mm. Good old Abe Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, these guys here, he he could actually teach our Congress and presidents a thing or two about indefinite detentions and... Subsidizing. Subsidizing. Didn't he have something to do with habeas corpus? Suspending habeas oh, corpus. Right. Posse comitatus. He's the reason there's a posse comitatus. Right. And for somebody who doesn't speak Latin, Posse Comitatus is? I don't know. Uh, that's basically where you can't use the you can't troops. Use you can't use the troops against... Federal troops against people. Mm-hmm. The, the citizens. Right, that's how we Wait, got. wait. You can't? No. Well, what does the NDAA say? That you, you can. can. So does that supersede Posse Comitatus? Of course. Whatever's newest, whatever God told us to do lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know why there's this argument um, over whether we're God's chosen warriors or not. Obviously, we win everywhere we go. So, obviously, we're the blessed ones. Right. It's a legitimate wait, argument. Wait. Well, we we won in Vietnam, right? In in the we, view of attrition, sure. We we won. Or, I mean, in the in the view of, not in the view of attrition. In attri- by attrition, we lost. But as far as um, pound for pound, we piled them up. Okay, so did we win in Afghanistan the first time, or two million to fifty-five thousand, fifty-eight? We, we won in Vietnam. We won in Iraq, right? <clears throat> two, uh, no. Two million to fifty-six thousand, I think it was. Oh. It's about a thirty-six to one ratio of total awesomeness. So, so if we if we kill if we kill more, we win. Is that is yeah. that your definition? Well, you um. What's funny is um, the West was really shocked in Greece's war that basically precluded to World War II. When the Nazis were back in the uh, socialists in Greece and we were back in the uh, democracy-loving <clears throat> other side, and we assumed that our side would win, the side that we were backing, just because they were right. And they actually got their butts handed to them. It was a huge shock to Western culture that just because you're right doesn't mean you're going to win. What? Hmm. Let's see who's 
on the hotline. Dare called our hotline. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, good morning. This is Ben. Ben, what's on your mind? Uh, good morning, Steve, Josh, Aaron. Howdy. You guys are like a tomahawk of truth in the skull of lies. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very racist. Don't you? Are you sure? Wow, that's a good one, though. I'm just calling it like it is. What you got? Uh, you guys, are, you guys are right on track this morning. I uh, I was thinking this week a lot about a couple of weeks ago. Josh, you brought up uh, Pat Robertson and the Christian right, the moral majority, and the contract with America, and all that stuff, and. You know, at first, it, uh, you know, I grew up on all that. All those guys were my, you know, I I read guys like uh, Pat Buchanan and World Magazine, and uh, I grew up on uh, uh, those guys in Colorado Springs, focused on the family, you yeah. know, and uh, listening to their kids' shows and stuff. And at first, what you said kind of bothered me, and I started remembering back to, like, all of the, uh, you know, they had episodes you know, when I was a kid listening to these kid shows about how evil draft dodgers were and how it's so important to be brave and just go to Vietnam anyway. And um, I just on and on and on. And I started thinking about, man, I went to, I grew up in a Christian school and, uh, you know, pledge allegiance to the flag every day. And I, I've been to tons of church functions where we sing the national anthem. And Ben, ben you did know, you also pledge our, allegiance to the Christian flag? Yeah, every once in a while. It just seems that's an important strange word. looking back, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, you know, because because I think I think saluting a flag is in the in the Bible. I think it's right there, towards the end of the New Testament. Make sure you do this every day with <laughs> school kids. Um, anyway, but you know, I just I wanted to, you know, you brought up Peter King again this morning as a perfect example of. Um, anyway, it just it just is crazy to me. Uh, it bothers me a lot. So I guess this question is turning into a rant, but. Keep it coming. Yeah. Why did the uh, Why is it that the church so has so completely bought into the stupidity of nationalism? That's my question. Why uh, has the church? I mean, just been so fooled by all of that nonsense and propaganda and bought into it. And you know, I mean, you, I mean, I heard pastors, you know, just tell jokes about, you know, literally tell jokes from the pulpit about, uh, you know. Uh, terrorism and just, you know, just sort of uh, Islamic extremism and, you know, why does that happen? I just, it just astounds me, you know, that that the church has so fought uh, the state's line and, and, and become a part of it and jumped in and, and, and wanting to make change in the world uh, and wanting to see the world a better place. You know, and, uh, you mean force change into the world? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And buying in to try to, you know, and working so hard to elect politicians and glorifying the Constitution and all that stuff. Um, you know, there was uh, I read an article this week on LewRockwell dot com, uh, and it was it was about a a preacher who during the Wilson administration they were having all the churches in the Northeast. I don't know if it was a state thing or a national thing, but. They told all these pastors to basically, at some point in their service, uh, you know, do a small thing where they basically pitched uh, war bonds. And this pastor up in uh, Connecticut refused. He wouldn't take any part in it. He thought it was evil. Good for him. And uh, and they threw him in jail for over a year for not doing that in his church. And uh, it's like, how far back does this craziness go? Wasn't it you know? Hamilton Acres here not too long ago? I, the church... And if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I think it was. They had some on their billboard, something that was like nuke until they glow, or they had something to do with uh, nuke in Iraq or Iran, one of the two, on their billboard. Uh, actually, uh, promoting. Ben, ben, if you look historically speaking, this is not anything new at all. I mean, you can see it in World War II. The Lutheran Church was required to say a pledge of allegiance basically to Hitler, and there were some people who refused to do so and basically were expelled from the church. And then after the war, those who had stayed in the church basically hung their heads in shame, and you had to have this this deal of reconciliation between the two factors. You go back further than that, uh, wow, uh, the the Reformation Wars, the, uh, the the wars in Czechoslovakia over or what, the what Crusades, became, yeah, well the Crusades obviously that too, but uh, I mean Christians have gotten all mixed up. I was talking in about the Crusade politics. we're on right now. Oh, they're. It is a kind of a sense of a new one, but, but it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, Ben. 
I mean, that that's why Jesus very clearly said, my kingdom is of this world. You need to get out and vote, <laughs> right. and you need to do so early. Early voting is the way. Isn't that what well, Jesus said? A lot said? of translations miss that. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, yeah. If you're, Bad if, translations. That's what, Matthew 28, right, is the Great Commission to go out there and convert as many people as you can by killing them if they don't. By the sword. By, by Convert them by the sword. If they don't accept Jesus Christ into their heart, you need to put them to the sword. Isn't that what Jesus said to do, Ben? Well, well, we all know about, like, the Spanish Inquisition and, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, it's just, it's amazing to me that you grow up learning about how, how ridiculous those things are. Can you believe those people did that and how ridiculous were the Crusades? But we're still doing it, and we're still preaching it, and it's it's so prevalent right now that and people are so ingrained in it and brainwashed in it that they can't even understand that they're part of it, and it's it's just crazy. Dave Giesel, it's literally a psychosis. Dave Giesel just texted me. He said that his answer to you would be that the church is no different. The corporate church is no different than any other institution. It's run by men, guided by social costs and acceptance, and driven by a desire for power. Ouch. 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 Especially the acceptance part. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't be... How accepted are you going to be if you're talking against these kind of things? Especially at church. Yeah, you I might. mean, you start out... And how do you? How do the, all these churches start off anyways? How do they become a church? They go down and they get their 501c3. Well, they start out by going status. to school so they can obtain a 501c3. Aha. That too. No, no you got to understand that. No, uh, it's because they're called by the Holy Spirit. Mm, not all churches Ooh. start by getting a 501c3. Sometimes That's true. They, they, sometimes the 501c3 comes in later when you find out that you can get a tax break. And so you end up filing not because you want to be under the state, but because you want to be out from under the state and not have to pay taxes on top of the taxes that people already pay. Then you have to, all of these, basically a church is run on donations, and you can go in and say, hey, look. Uh, this this money has already been taxed. I think Chuck Baldwin's church. I don't. I'm no so for they, a fact. He the didn't church have a church is getting a giveaway then. I don't think he pays tax. This oh, because they're not being either. taxed. They're getting a giveaway. You know, that's basically the same reasoning that you hear in some of the politicians today about the oil companies. But that's you know they're going to go off on a different. Because we all have to pay our fair share, right? Ben, are you still there? Well, th yeah, I'm here. I just think that you know where I might differ from Dave is that I I do believe that altruism exists. I do believe that God has the ability to inspire uh, people to change and change men's hearts. And so, yeah, I do think that I do think that there are a lot of uh, people who get together and uh, you know, in the name of Christ and call it church or whatever and eventually, you know, get the 50123 and the corruption and all everything else that, you know, can come along with all of that. Um and and buying into statism is just one of those things, you know, when you get you get groupthink, when you get a lot of people together and people aren't willing to stand up against their friends and say actually you're wrong. And yes, that's you know. that's exactly right. What what I think was part of the problem, why we are, why it is the situation it is now, the way it's gone so far, is because the church decided that it wanted to be involved with the government. It wanted to change it. We need to make change, which we need to force change, right? The church was never called to force anyone to do anything. It's taking too long to convince people. Let's, exactly. just go ahead and, let's just go ahead and make them change. So once we did that, who won out? The state won out because the state converted the church to be a status, not the other way around. The church didn't. Well, as soon as, as, soon as they tried to enter into that, they kind of changed gods, didn't they? Oh, oh yeah, exactly. Oh. The state is their god, but they want to be accepted in it. They want to be accepted by the state. They want to be accepted by their friends, like Ben said. You go to your Republican conventions, and they, two or three of them talk about God, and two or three of them pray at the meeting. You think, well, this must be okay. And they never, you know, you just blind your eyes when they start talking about killing people, throwing people in jail for whatever reason, doing everything that the Bible tells them not to do, that they should not be a part of, they're a part of. Yeah, and we, we legitimize it because it's, well, that's the state. And Romans 13 said that everything the state does is good, and you should submit to the state no matter what, mm -hmm. which is bunk. We're going to get to that pretty soon, huh? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, like, but do do the same people that um, basically fall back on that as their excuse, they're, they're not going to take their wife in to get an abortion because the state mandated you can only have one kid. They're not going to go kill their grandma if the state tells oh, them that they have to They go. might. 
Well, yeah. They might. They might. Theoretically, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And say that's the line that they're going to draw and say that they're, they're going to stop obeying the state at that point? But if there is any point, then the claim's kind of illegitimate, isn't it? Right. That you, that you have to follow the state at all times? Right. I mean, the state say that I have a line. Usually they correlate it with getting their guns taken away. Basically, well, the church has decided that it wants to be accepted by the world. Yeah. Oh, up against the break, Ben. Thanks so much for calling in. 458 Tonga is the number if you want to be a part of the program. This is the Far North Radical Saturday morning wake up call. Well, welcome back to Nottingham, so to speak. Uh, kind of a metaphorical Nottingham. This is the Saturday morning wake up call coming to you live from Fairbanks, Alaska, but streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. And incidentally, if you've got a smartphone, you can find us with the free TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to the program. I'm Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio, just kind of the chimpanzee behind the board here to make sure that everything stays on the air. The real force behind the show, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises and Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical. All right. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Where do we go from here? I really want to make a comment about Joe Thomas's ad. Go for it. I know you do, so let's do this. Because it pisses me off. Joe Thomas has an ad up um, that runs that he's uh, trying to keep the oil companies from getting a $20 billion um, handout. Giveaway. Giveaway. The state legislator and the governor want to give away $20 billion. And he's he's putting a spin on it that they're going to give the oil companies $20 billion when actually they're proposing to lower the tax rate that they're currently hammering the oil companies with. So the kind of thinking that we have is an entitlement thinking that we're, we deserve and we're owed that money. So stolen money, taking money via taxes is owed to us. So if we take less, we're actually giving a giveaway. I hope nobody's listening to that ad. Well, that means that we're, because we don't steal, we're giving away what's rightfully ours. Sure. If we, if, if we decide we're going to steal a little bit less, we're actually giving it away. Well, that's kind of like budget cuts when they, from, instead of, re, um, instead of increasing the budget by $13 billion, they only increase it by 5 There's still an increase, but they call it a budget cut, which I love that. Right. There's a, a certain mayor made that claim, basically, that he uh, saved everybody money. <laughs> Another great commercial I've been hearing on your rate on your station, Steve, is from uh, Higgins, and he's saying that he uh, he's a businessman and he is a successful one, and he says that he wants to get into government so he can give back to the community. I have a problem with the association of giving back, being a part of being associated with being a politician. How are you giving back? You're getting paid to do that. You're running people's lives. You're you have a position of power, and you're giving back while you're getting paid because some you're stolen a public money. servant, Josh. Aha! I would say that the people that give back, he is giving back to the community right now by having his business. Just like I think one of the things he says is we need business owners to get in there and give back. Blah blah. blah. Business owners already give back from the service that they provide to the community. They give back by giving jobs. They give back by buying equipment, parts, whatever industry you're in that that keeps the local economy going. And by paying taxes. That's and, a form of giving. Oh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. No. <laughs> so this whole thought that going into government to give back, it's just it's a farce. The people that are giving back are the ones that are in the community in the first place, not the ones that are going out and stealing. That's That's taking. That's not giving. So, Josh, let me get this straight. You, you've you taken to task a Democrat this morning, and now you've also taken to task a Republican. What what are you? I'm starting to think that Josh, you know, doesn't want anybody to win. <laughs> I'm the guy that Glenn Beck warned you about. Yeah, Glenn Beck <laughs> did warn me about you this morning. <laughs> the, the three type of um, extremists we should fear, the... The Islamo-fascist, the extreme socialist liberal, and the anarchist. 
Well, aren't we supposed to fear extremism of any type? Aren't we? Aren't we told that again and again that the only real evil in this world is extremism? Sure, unless it's extremely right-leaning, kill the brown people. Unless it's extreme patriotic Americanism, American government governmentism. Yeah. I, Going I, back to what we were talking yeah. about a little minute ago when uh, Dave wrote me again, and I think this is this is it. He said the established religious thought at any given point in history has never been challenged by the status quo. This applies to Christianity today, which is hard to accept. Christianity today will not challenge the status quo. We just get along with it. In fact, we don't just get along with it. We advocate for it and promote it, promote it and push it. We have now what where we have these things where we the churches stop to pray for the elections and pray for the votes and pray for the people they want to get in and blah, blah, blah. And I think it was... Uh, yeah, Bob, nationwide pastors coming together to have a 501c3 free day so they can tell everybody to vote for Mitt. I think it was uh, Lawrence Vance. I probably got it wrong who this was. I thought he he was pretty... He said something pretty interesting. I, I read one time he said... God tells us to pray for our leaders. He said, he's, why does he say that? He said, because we're supposed to pray for our enemies. Oh, snap. Well, I mean, even earlier you made a reference to a, a scripture that a lot of people interpret that somehow we are supposed to be subject to the government in all things. Uh, it, and I, I'm not sure I would really interpret it that way. because it Isn't seems, that what the Bible says, though? Well, I, I think the whole point of it is that you're not supposed to be making waves so that when they round you up to kill you, they're not killing you because you broke their laws, but they're killing you because you make a profession for Christ. I mean, to me, it makes a big, there's a there's a big difference if they can round you up because you are uh, <laughs> locked up in some compound with a whole bunch of guns pointing out, uh, saying, yeah, you come and get my guns, as opposed to them locking you up because you're out there on the tr- talking to people about Jesus. I mean, it seems to me like there's a big difference in that kind of, in the reason why they would arrest you. Here's am, little, am I wrong? No. Here's a little mantra for you. The war in Iraq was a just war, Romans 13. The troop surge is necessary, Romans 13. Dropping the atomic bombs on Japan is necessary, Romans 13. President Bush did the right thing with the intelligence he had, Romans 13. Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, Romans 13. Collateral damage happens, Romans 13. The Vietnam War was necessary, Romans 13. My country, right or wrong, Romans 13. Soldiers are just following orders. So let me read Romans, Romans 13. 13. For rulers are <clears throat> for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, the key thing that um, this, um, what is his name, that Chuck Baldwin points out is that there's a limit to that authority, right? Chuck? Pastor Chuck. The Black Robe Regiment. Yeah, he said, um, dang it, I lost my spot. Notice the civil government must not be a terror to good works. It has no power or authority to terrorize good works or good people. God never gave it that authority. And any government that oversteps that divine boundary has no divine authority or protection. Uh. <laughs> so to, to blindly turn your eye and mm-hmm. say, I mean, and, and we all know that. I mean, like, we're not, if, the, if a government sign says don't step on the grass or a government sign says... Um, you know, or if you're driving uh, home, you're not going to go over the speed limit, but you know that there's a limit to that good work. If the government tells you to turn in all your guns, or the government tells you to bring your wife in to abort her baby if it's pregnant, you know there's those defining lines. And that's the way Romans 13 is laid out anyway. So to give it a, a blanket pass is not even is totally contrary to what's actually written. Contrary to what was taught, I know someone. What was it yesterday? The other day, someone said something about. Well, hmm, can't quite remember that even Jesus submitted to authority, right? With uh, Pilate. But what did he tell Pilate? He goes, "The only reason you have this power over me right now is because it was given to you for this time. That was it. He never submitted to said that you are my masters, Pilate." He never admitted that at all. In fact, he said, I can call 
a legion of angels down and whoop you right now, basically, if he wanted to. But it was given to Pilate for that time to be able to have that power. But he never ceded that Pilate had authority over him. Never. So you, so you see a difference between power and authority, Josh? Absolutely. Power is the ability to force your will on someone. Authority is having the right to do that. All right. It, it, I think it's really close to... Um, did Pilate have the right to kill Christ? Well, sure he did. He was a state. <laughs> Well, I mean, just look at how we how we mess all this up. We would say that no, he he didn't have the right to kill Christ. He had he was the power was given to him. So we could see that that was wrong. I mean, who in the right mind would say that his murder was correct, was right? I mean, we know it had to happen, but was it right? No, it was a murder. He was murdered. But at the same time, we don't we blind our eyes to what goes on with the state right now, and it's all because it is the state because we've institutionalized the new god. And when the state does it, we say, well, it's okay, Romans 13. No, it's not. Murder is still murder. Theft right. is still theft. So essentially... Debauchery the, is still debauchery. The, the, the question is, is, is what extent does it go to where disobedience becomes obedience to God? Disobedience to the state. I think that's a case-by-case case situation. Well, sure it is. Well, there, there is a principle involved, though. I mean, if you see a sign that says no trespassing... Right. You have a duty not to trespass. You have a duty. I would say a moral duty not to trespass. But if on that other side of that fence with a sign that says no trespassing, you see a little kid drowning in a pond, you have a moral duty to go and save that child's life. Mm -hmm. Even if that means that you must, in order to fulfill that higher purpose of saving life, break the law by trespassing and topping that fence to go save that child's life. Right. Right. So, so, I mean, it seems to me that that issue of where is the higher law has been what is befuddled in people's mind. Well, I think it's because we look at things and say, we look at the state and said, well, Christians do. They're not forcing us to have abortions. They're not forcing us to go to war. They're not forcing, well, are they not? They're not forcing us, but they allow it. Right. And they look make you our, pay our for it. global force for good now is all volunteer. Right. So we just look at it just like, well, if they ever force us to do these things, then we'll say that it's wrong and we won't do it. We'll follow God rather than man. But as long as we're not forced to, we'll support it. Acts 5.29 says, obey God rather than men. <clears throat> and if you if you really think about it, we only, we only um, hold that standard up for ourselves of blind obedience. Now, we don't, we don't see that view across the board. I'd like to read something else from the same guy. He says, um, what about Christians in other countries? Shouldn't they also obey the powers that be? Aren't there powers that be likewise ordained of God? What if their government instructs them to conduct drone attacks in the United States, bomb the United States, commit acts of terrorism against the United States, or invade the United States? Aren't they resisting the ordinance of God if they don't do it? Should all Christian soldiers in the German army during World War II have disobeyed orders and laid down their weapons when America entered the war? Christian warmongers are such hypocrites. They are very selective about which governments they think Christians should obey, and what they really mean by their mantra is that all people everywhere in the world should not only obey the powers that that all people everywhere should only obey the powers that be in the United States. Right. Bum, bum, bum. It's definitely not a, a blanket mentality. Well, it really comes down to the social acceptance. I mean, if, you, uh, if you're if you a pastor or a guy on the radio or something that speaks out against these things, against the state and says, no, you're wrong, well, there's retribution. People don't like you. People call up and say, shame on you. People might not go to your church because you're not patriotic. But what's their patriotic, what is there to be patriotic about? Oh, or the CIA shuts off your station. Well, that's just the monitoring feed that's always on. Oh, um, pay no attention. I think, to uh, here's an interesting uh, spin on it I'd like to throw out there. Um, I think, obviously, the correlation between um, um, parents and their children is kind of similar to the correlation between government and its subjects, so to speak. And God says the same thing about that parental child correlation as he does about government and he says children obey your parents in the lord for this is right 
that's not a blanket comment. That's not saying, obey children, obey your parents no matter what. Right? How oh. How is that? How? Okay. Well, I th- how again, many... it's that, that higher principle. I think most of us would say it's right for a child to obey its parents unless that parent is molesting the child. And right. or and unless that parent is making that child go to an Arab speaking and, and, Muslim basically school. Basically what you're saying, Steve, is uh-huh. when it steps out from being in the Lord, right? Yeah, exactly. So when your government's conducting drone strikes, when your government's propping up a petrodollar, when your government's wantonly killing anybody, using the the use of force for any ends that it sees fit. How is it any different? You know, I think a lot of it, too, is uh, Christians, because I've heard them, they say, well, look at the Old Testament. God used Israel to wipe out this nation or that nation, and they killed everyone and blah, blah, blah. Well, the correct answer to that is so. Is America the nation of Israel under the direct rule of God? Is America... Well, God's many new have Israel. Heard say America is the new Israel. I know. I've, I've actually I've heard people say that too. And there's another issue too of how you interpret the Bible, Josh. Because if some people, if you go to the Bible and you say, okay, well I'm going to read this right here as prescriptive, telling me what to do, or I'm going to read this as descriptive. This is what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a big difference because if you know, you could approach the entire Bible as prescriptive. Which means then that we should all, like Abraham, go and sacrifice our sons. Yep, you're right, Steve. We up, should. Up on the mountain. Or we should, well, I guess, you know, in a sense we do if we send them off to war, don't we? Mm-hmm. We, we should all, like the, the Old Testament tells us, that we should not cut the sides of our heads, the, the sides of our hair. We should grow our hair long. Like Samson, we should also grow our hair long. Right? Yep. If, I mean, if everything is prescriptive and not just descriptive, then, you know, you get yourself into all kinds. You can paint yourself into a corner real quick. Either way, in the New Testament, you can't see anything where, or the old, where God told America to do anything that we're doing right now. And you sure can't see anything it's, in Romans 13 where the Romans 13 doesn't tell the Christian to promote the state, does it? It says to pay your taxes. That's promoting the state. Oh, you want to go on that one? Oh, right. Before we get there, oh, though, okay. I want to go back. This is this is what I think is the correct. This is descriptive. When Israel demanded a king from Samuel, and Samuel was ticked off, and he went to God and said, look at these dirty rats. <laughs> and God said, obey the voice of the people and all they say to you, for they've not rejected you, but they reject me from being their king. So, Christians, I'm going to be descriptive and prescriptive. <laughs> Going to be both here. Is your God the state? If you're promoting the state so much and you want to be in there, and I mean, always it's for the good, but it's not good. It's for evil. The it's for the children. So who's your God? When you choose one or the other, you can't have two masters. You have to obey one or the other. When you're promoting one, you're not promoting the other. I mean, at the very least, the very least, if you look at the time spent that people make, that people spend on political processes, politics, blah, 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 which is every stinking year we have political processes. All the time and money spent to that could be focused somewhere else. The church surely could focus it on what the Great Commission was. To go and kill everybody who doesn't believe, wait, no, that's not what it actually says, is it? No, it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say to promote about, the government. Something it, about teaching and preaching and baptizing, isn't it? Yeah. Steve. No, I'm just, Your I'm, version of the Bible are so weird. I kind of a translation to see you. <laughs> Let's see who's on the hotline again. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, what's on your mind? <laughs> Oh, I just thought I'd call in and talk to Reverend Josh and Alter Boy Aaron. <laughs> since, Alter since Boy. Since we're going to talk about Jesus and church and the Bible all morning, I might as well call in. We're not going to talk about waterways and contracts? No, we'll save waterways and contracts for a different show. Okay. Dang you it. guys are doing good. You guys are on a good topic. Um, I wanted to point out, I was listening to Ben's call, and I just wanted to point out, uh, and I'm sure he's aware of this as well, but the state has used 
religion since the beginning of time to justify its actions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go back to, you know, the pharaohs, you know, they were gods, so they're using this religion, you know, whatever we say is right. The Babylonians, you know, they had Baal and Ishtar and Babylonian mystery religion, and they justified all their actions through, you know, basically religious means. And the state always co-ops that intellectual class to defend its position to the people. Because, of course, the people are going to go, oh, this is wrong. But then when the, you know, when the priests or the, you know, nowadays it's the scientists and the other intellectual classes, you know, say, oh, no, this is good. We can control the economy by managing it and understanding, you know, the big picture and blah, 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 blah. And then everybody goes, oh, okay, that's why it's okay for them to steal from me. So I think it's been a continuous problem since you know, since basically the beginning of time. But and look at the, you, what the church uses or what the state uses for its wars. It, it goes the the Muslim war right now, which is basically what it is. We're in a Muslim war. They've used the the pulpit to say the Muslims have been at war with us since the beginning of Islam. Oh yeah, and then you and then they get their talking heads to to trump out all the facts. You get Glenn back out there, you know. Giving us all the history about how bad they are because they're brown and blah blah blah. They're just and like then, anarchists. And then we can, ju- yeah, they're just like anarchists. So then we can justify, you know, killing them. And you know, there's not dead four-year-olds in the streets in America, so Yet. everybody feels pretty cool with it. Yes. Yeah, but how many uh, dead four-year-olds were there in uh, Iraq? Oh, I'm sure there's been lots of dead four-year-olds. It was in Iraq. actually recorded in before being before the war started. Before, before the second war, before we started the war, five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand children. There's no yeah, such thing Madeline as Yeah, but Madeline Albright back. said that that was okay, right? Because it was in our best interest. They actually to said it. it in they, Iraq. they actually said it was an acceptable loss. And they that's also the breaks. Said, yeah, that's the break. <laughs> <laughs> they also that's said the that uh, Ron Paul's theory of blowback was just silliness. You're so dumb. Why would they want to come over here and kill us just because we killed all their kids? Because oh, we yeah. killed Plus, half a million children. That guy's old, though. Plus, he's like cox money. So, I mean, that guy's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and isn't he like... He's an Austrian, but he's uh, an American. It's all those yeah. Ron, it's all those Ronbots that really is the problem. I, I, didn't he go out and make a, an entire race of people that are basically controlled by him? Actually, I found out that Ron Paul is part of the Illuminati. Oh, is he? Yep, found mm-hmm. that out last night. It was a great article. And uh, Lou Rockwell's last name used to be Lou Rothschild. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that explains an awful lot it's right amazing. there. Amazing. And and as we all know, most Austrians come from. I mean, most Jews come from Austria, so if they're Austrian economics... So. <laughs> that, did you read the same article? No, I didn't. Because that's exactly <laughs> that what that real? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Austrian oh. economics was actually a plot by the Jewish community to take over the world. I want, I, it's I not want working very good. No, it's not. No, no, going nobody. With it. Go ahead. I, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I wanted to point out something on Romans 13, too, before I go to work here. What? Um, I know, it's crazy, but... If you look at the Bible, almost every major figure throughout the whole Bible disobeyed the government. So you've got Moses, you know, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go, marches them out. You know, he wasn't obeying the government that he was under. Then you've got King David, who disobeyed Saul yep. and ran from him and, you know, all that, the whole nine yards. I mean, the whole story, right? Mm-hmm. Then you go further on and you come into the New Testament and Jesus was killed because he was telling people he was God, and Caesar was God. So he was basically killed for preaching a false religion. Um, and then, you know, all, all the apostles the, were all killed, the apostles except for John. Were killed, uh, locked up, imprisoned, stoned. For doing what? What they were doing was against the law. There's they th- weren't allowed to preach Jesus' resurrection. That was against the law. And so to take one obscure verse, which is just saying that real authority comes from God, real authority, not just force and power, but actual authority comes from God, and using that as a justification for anything that any government wants to do is completely absurd and goes against the entire rest of the Bible. And if you believe that, you know, that that's, that the Bible is supposed to be consistent, and we see all of our you know, the main characters who we look to in the Christian faith as being disobedient to their governments. That includes um, Martin Luther and William Tynadale. Oh, yeah. Tyndale. Or Martin Luther King Jr. Mm-hmm. Or look or... at uh, Paul. 
when he mocked, you know, people say, well, at least going to respect those people, respect your authority. And Paul mocked Nero. Yeah. When he didn't finish the race, but they were scared because what Nero fell off the chariot or whatever. So, but they still crowned him the winner at the end of the race, even though he didn't finish the race. And, uh, Basically, Paul was mocking him at the the athlete. I can't remember what. Oh no, I just went blank. No, Basically, he's talking about Paul says, "I have finished the race. I will be crowned." Yeah. Well, you kind of alluded to the to the how stupid this is when you read that little that little blurb that you read a few minutes ago on air. Basically, if somebody says that Romans 13 means that we should obey the government. What you're saying is that all governments are instituted amongst men by God. In other words, we had no right to go into Iraq and overthrow Saddam oh, Hussein. Oh, oh, snap! Because yeah. Saddam Hussein was put in place by God. And so was or the Taliban. we have no right to go into so Iraq Hitler. and overthrow them because they were put in by God. So was Hitler and, and Stalin. And on and on and yeah. on and on. Hitler and Mussolini and Mao and Lenin. And, and Obama. Everybody. Uh-huh. So at what point do we go back in history? Basically, our country shouldn't exist because we didn't have the right we to overthrow the king We rebelled against the king, exactly. So at what point, I mean, if you <clears throat> use that logic, no country that's ever come into existence has had the right to overthrow whoever it overthrew to come into existence. So What about I mean, our manifest ju- destiny, though, Jeremiah? Well, that's... A, you know, that was God changed his mind since then. And, he must you know, have changed. Kind of changed some stuff. And, and he took the birthright from the Israelites and gave it to and gave it to America. Yeah, America. Oh, America. Yeah. A beacon oh. of hope. <laughs> and change. global force for good. Get it. Oh. Yeah, Adelante. I, did you, okay, Anyways, incidentally. I'll get off here and let you guys. Thanks, Jeremiah. Appreciate that. You know, thanks, man. One of the things I'd like to correlate there is he hit on the revolution where we broke away. And one of the big defining reasons that happened is because our pastors at the time the black robe regiment what they call them were preaching um statelessness preaching from the pulpit that they weren't bound um bound by god to obey the king Mm -hmm. but instead we're bound by god to obey god right we're, we're we're bound by god to obey this ordained manifest destiny no, I don't think that's what they said. No, actually, they preached for revolution because they said we should have no king. Yeah, but what about where the Bible mandates that we should pay taxes? We're at the end of the hour. Dang it. <laughs> you guys hope? skirted that and went all around, and now it's over. This is uh, dinner music for a hungry pack of cannibals. That's the name of the song. Sounds like a Bob Hope show. All right, we're up against the Fox News here at the top of the hour. Stay with us. Hour 2 is on the way. 458-TALK is the number if you'd like to get in that way, or you can jump in the chat room, kfar660.com. Just keep in mind there's no lifeguard on duty. So if you jump into the chat room, you're on your own. Put your hands in the hair and wave them just like you don't, don't care what. I think that's the wrong song. Welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we are streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. And we are on your smartphone with the TuneIn Radio app. I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining us in the studio from Far North Tactical, we have Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. He can't talk. Good morning. He's got a mouthful of something. And we've also got from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. All right. Now, uh, we used to pretend that this was somehow a different show from the hour preceding. Uh, Have we abandoned that pretense? Yeah, pretty much. All right. So this is hour two of basically what is uh, an adventure. An odyssey. An an odyssey and anarchism. It's a hunger game. (laughs) It really is. We actually have three lines still on hold from uh, the last hour, people that we did not get to. uh, We're going to see if they are still there. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Oh. Hello. Who is this? Hey, this is Claudio. Claudio, what's on your mind? Hello, Claudio. Okay, uh, for people that are uh, for people that are defending war for Israel, you know, you should go for Israel. Uh, I think those Christians have very little faith because uh, who's supposed to be the deliverer of Israel is God, not the Almighty United States. Are you serious? Israel doesn't need the United States. That's I don't amazing. Think, yeah, one they have enough weapons to take care of themselves. The other one is when things get really bad for them, it's not the United States is not going to be able to do anything. God is the one that's supposed to do that. 
Right. He said he was the deliverer of Israel. Yeah. And, and he never brought up the United States of America in that discourse. But it's our manifest destiny. We are. You know we are the delivery that is spoken of. We're the right hand. Because we're God. I'm. Uh, I'm probably distinct from uh, Jewish people. I'm not Jewish, but uh, you know, my family came from. You don't even sound like you're American. Yeah, <laughs> from prosecutor prosecutors are Jew from from the Iberian Peninsula, and I was called anti-Semite because my view on that. <laughs> wow. So wait, your family was persecuted, or you your your family persecuted? Yeah, my my past, you know, like. 1500, 1600, 1700, or, you know, by the, the Inquisition. And, uh, you know, I'm not Jewish in, in, uh, by, by faith, but I'm by blood. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I was called Semite because I don't believe that the United States is the deliverer of Israel, but, but God. And uh, I don't have faith because I'll be cursed because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, blessing Israel, something like that. That's interesting. Well, Claudio, I happen to know that you are a church-going man. What kind of a church does not preach that Israel needs to be defended by the United States of America? I don't know. There's a flip church there. The Church of Obama? That's why we need Mitt Romney. Oh, wow. Wow. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good point, too. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thanks, Claudio. Appreciate your call. Uh, just, another, just another thing. I mentioned this before, but uh, you know, if you think about what uh, was Satan, I talked with Josh another day about that. What G Satan tried to bribe Jesus with? The state. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, with power and political power, right? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'll let you guys go. All, all these kingdoms. Bow down to me, me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Hmm. Yeah, and they, Jesus never argued with them whether they were his mm -hmm, or not. Exactly. Ha <laughs> beat you to it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Four, five, eight, talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, what's on your mind? Uh, in the last hour on the different, but sort of the same show, but different. <laughs> we've, uh, we've abandoned the pretense. It's hour one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Aaron brought out about a Joe, the Joe Thomas ads where those ads uh, complain about giving back some of the money that was taken from the oil companies, and Aaron indicated that that money was irrighteously taken in the first place, and I kind of agree with that sentiment. But I wanted to ask uh, Aaron or Josh, what about uh, taking the royalty oil that was agreed to prior to the development and the investment of all the billions of dollars of in infrastructure, and also what if a certain tax rate in addition on top of the royalty was agreed to prior to the investment, would you feel that that would be righteous to do? Well, what I feel is that to make the pretense that um, giving them a tax break to the tune of $20 billion um, and to correlate that back into saying that we're giving them $20 billion instead of saying that we're going to take $20 billion less from them is... Obviously, he's putting a spin on it to make you think that we're giving money away. Yeah, and I think in the from the very beginning, I mean, if you look at it from a status point of view, let's, I'll go minarchist here. So we got, I'm Mr. Minarchist Limited Government Guy, and so I would say that, yes, if the oil companies agreed to and the state agreed to blah, 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 then each side should hold their agreement. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Okay, but I am not a minarchist or a small government kind of guy. I say that the state has no business, well, even existing, the state has no business charging a royalty, quote-unquote, tax on the oil that's under the ground anyway. Who are they to say that they own it? Just because a document says that none of mm -hmm. us can own it, but the state does? Why, why does the state own it? You know, they stole that from the rightful owners, which would be the people that own the land. Because... I can find oil under my house if I could find oil under my house. I don't own it, uh -huh. even though I supposedly own the land. So, no, the state shouldn't have the right to tax it in the first place. The state doesn't have ownership, should not have ownership of the oil in the first place to even bargain with. The oil company should be able to go up there, drill baby drill, and sell it to us at a reduced rate. I see. <laughs> but we're all placated by the fact that it's our oil. We're all placated by the fact that we are given a subsidy, a small portion of the 
reward from having that oil that doesn't belong to any of us but belongs to all of us. We are placated by that government handout. Yeah, but sure. if we don't take our rightful $20 billion, you're going to get less in your dividend. And we don't even understand the fact that because we've allowed the state to exist, but because we have a state that is allowed to tax the oil companies so they can exist, so the state can exist, we actually paid more for our energy because there's like a two dollar and something tax on every gallon that comes down there, right? We've also paid. Don't we pay royalty oil gas? Mm -hmm. We do. We pay the same price here in Alaska for the oil that comes out of the ground here in Alaska as they pay down at actually they pay less down at the pump for Alaskan oil in other states. So we're by default being taxed by the state. We are. Every citizen. And okay. we well, have to go down and buy a gallon of oil. On or top of that, there is an additional tax that the state charges, which I mean, what is that, like $7 or $0.07 cents eight. per gallon? $0.08 cents eight per gallon. Cents a gallon. Which our greedy bastard legislature would not even suspend when things got bad last year. Do you remember that? Yep. They would not even suspend an $0.08 cent per gallon tax because they felt it was their money to do things with, even though we are rolling in money down there in Juneau. Down there in Juneau, but we're definitely not rolling in money up here in Fairbanks to no, no, no. the people. Mm -hmm. Also, if I could just ask one other thing, too. Uh, I think maybe that the state of Alaska is taking like the, like maybe $7 billion a year from the oil companies at this time. I'm not precisely sure of those figures. But you've heard some people who don't want to give back any of that money. They, they'll we'll kind of move a little bit, and they'll say, well, we'll give them back if they guarantee, you know, like sign in blood that they will invest so much and so forth. And I'm wondering, what about that philosophy being extended to the people at large where the state of Alaska could propose a 40% income tax on everybody unless, and but they'll give some of it back if they promise by signing in red that they will do better and invest more in Alaska instead of buying food that's grown outside. They'll by hiring outside people. And do something <laughs> and get some of their money back. Would that be a good idea to encourage more investment in Alaska, to slap a 40% income tax on all people? You know, Randy, if they just would stop taxing us on the improvements we make, uh -huh. you know, you think about your when you do any improvement to your property, your own home, what happens? Does the borough give you a tax break and say, oh, well, you're improving your property. You are, you're you are improving investing, society. You are investing in the future here in Alaska. No. They go out and they say, hey, your house is worth more. And they immediately raise your taxes. They punish and you. It's immediately. There's not even a discussion. You have to go down there and appeal of why you think that they should not raise your taxes. Yeah. It, it just for making an improvement. So you want to see people investing in the state? Get them to stop penalizing us for making improvements. I think he's being facetious when he's talking about an income tax on the people, but it's a pretty good point. What would it, what would encourage more investment? Taxing people mm. and then giving them a break or not taxing them? What do you invest with? Cash money, right? right exactly. That's what you use. You use money to invest with. So if you have less, you have less to invest with. Thanks for the call, Randy. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, good morning, Steve. This is the Battle Axe. I've been enjoying it, uh, listening to my agent provocateur. Uh, <laughs> that's what uh, we're here for. And uh, you notice there's nobody's mentioning Iceland. In the last few months, Iceland has had a revolution. Uh, they have uh, dissolved their uh, Congress. They have kicked the banks out of the country because somebody there went smart, checked back, and found out that the banks had been, uh, you know, with their usual manipulations and putting their losses on the government. And they said, hey, the government never signed for this. We don't own it and uh, owe it. And they kicked them out, and they are in the process of making a new constitution. And you don't hear about it. It's been a bloodless revolution. They had just taken, you know, just straightened their country, kicked the banks out. I guess several bankers are already in jail, dissolved their Congress, and they're rewriting a new constitution. And evidently, the governments around the world are square, you know, scared to death to talk about it. Well, sure, that's so, not good news to be telling other people. Yeah. <laughs> you got to well, that, that kind so of wait, 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 wait. What you're telling me here, Marge, is that they, instead of giving the banks a bailout, 
they actually let the banks fail and then kicked them out of the country? Uh, I don't know about letting the banks fail. They just said, this debt that you say is ours is not ours. It is yours. And kicked the bankers out of the country, put a couple of them in jail, and uh, dissolved their parliament and are now going to write a new constitution. Every every revolution that happens um, in the last 30 to 40 years have been uh, widely ignored because it's not good politics to um, blast to whatever country you happen to be, you know, dominating over that this other country is having a revolution. I mean, the, the Philippines have had two in the last, what, 14 years? Two huge ones. They called them the Million Man March, and they ousted their government twice in a row, and you never heard a peep about it. Well, I t- think it was funny because I had heard it a little brief mention on the radio. And so I called up my daughter, who is quite a... She's a hacker and all in everything. And I said, hey... Look up the revolution for Iceland. She said, what are you talking about? So she got into it. And she called me back. She said, oh, my God. She said, why isn't this worldwide news? Well, why <laughs> was, why wasn't Japan worldwide yeah. news? Why wasn't yeah. the Philippines? It's all the same thing. Yeah. So it, uh, it'd be interesting to see just exactly, as I understand, uh, one of the, the captains on a fishing boat I was on out in the chain was Icelandic, and they had come to the country, and they said the reason was because I guess their constitution had been forced on them by uh, Europe. I think it was Denmark, I'm not too sure. And uh, that uh, they came to America because they liked our constitution better. Well, evidently, it is. Just got tired of the whole thing, we, and uh, I have a suspicion that uh, all this nonsense about our debt, aside from what we borrowed from China, is the bank's debt, international bankers' debts, and not ours. Well, we do so, we do blast certain revolutions, like the ones our CIA and black ops starts, Libya. No, don't get me started Egypt. on that. <laughs> Like we're I we're selective about which revolutions we blast on the airwaves. <laughs> uh, yeah, aside from, I, I wouldn't even comment. I said on the president the other day because uh, the, the words would be bleeped off and the FBI would be <laughs> knocking on my door. I think the very fact that you're thinking about it is going to get the FBI on knocking into your door. <laughs> yeah, aside from the fact that uh, the buck stops there, who stops that? Uh, reaction over there. Oh, Lord, and he's a liar. So, oh, you yeah. don't. So, <laughs> I'm, you know, I just sit here and pick up my copies of the Constitution and throw them on the floor and stomp on them and then pick them back up and say, hmm, you know. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you. Appreciate the phone Bye-bye. call. All right. Do you want to take some more phone calls? Or? All right. 458-TALK yeah, is the number. Good morning. Who's this? Hi, is this me? It might be you. Depends on who it is. Well, this is uh, Brent Cullen. How are you this morning? Brent, hey, congratulations. Brent. It is you. What's on your mind? So, uh, yeah, I was kind of fascinated by your top, our, uh, conversation before about business churches and uh, Bible and, you know, the fact that the ch- a lot of churches around town or every place is, are they're really kind of corporate entities. Right. And uh, and, and just to point out, you know, what what is the definition of the church? Is it is it really a business or not? Hmm. Um, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but it, it gets into this. You know, this you mentioned Josh about you know you can't serve two masters. So, you know, when this when a church sets up a business like that, you know they it's a, it's a contract or an agreement with the state. You set up bylaws, and I'm not sure what. The details of that that is, but you know, I assume they, you know, have to establish a bank account. So that kind of plugs in to all kinds of agreements with the state and the banking system. It actually amounts to all kinds of uh, what was the word I was going to use? <laughs> uh, dang it! Oh well, you lost conceding something. I was going to say it, it uh, amounts to a bunch of uh, concessions. From the church to the state, basically what is, you know, you know of uh, Chuck Baldwin, 
His his church doesn't he doesn't have a five one C three. Have you ever read anything that he's written whether his church pays taxes or anything like that? Uh no, not that particularly, but um there is a, a church, and I guess I put that in quotations, a non business church here in town and really I think they exist. Um my neighbor is part of a a non business church and um you know, of course there's they have uh get togethers and but everything everything is provided voluntarily. It just kind of happens organically. They um, someone pays, you know, a member pays for a facility, and they meet there. Uh, there's no collection, and there's there's thousands of people. He communicates with with fellow people in his congregation in Korea and all around the world. They they kind of communicate through email, and uh, they go to. They call them conventions. There's one in down in Wasilla, and I can't remember Haynes. I think there's one, and he, he travels around in the summertime to all all these different towns in the U.S. and sometimes goes out of the country and meets with these people. They have a uh, kind of a church leadership, um, pastors, if you will. I'm not sure what the title is, but they uh, they travel around and, and preach and talk about the Bible and and have services and uh there is no no collection basically hmm. now, now keep in mind i, I do i want to play devil's advocate for just a moment here on this issue of the 501c3 it basically in my understanding of it uh it's a reporting tool in which you report to the state only in terms of a bare bones structure so that you can verify that, yes, you in fact, you are an actual group of people and not just one family saying, hey, yeah, we're a church. Our our house should be tax exempt. It should be, it, it's only the place of where that you meet to worship that ends up becoming a tax exempt or, or any buildings that the church owns. All right. Now, the whole point of that. Or the income that they bring. Right, or the, well, that's that's the thing is that you don't, re- fi- but here in Alaska, you don't file an income tax uh, report as individuals. However, uh, a lot of people that I know that are good, solid Americans here in Alaska actually go out and they get business licenses. You know, they, they as individuals, they, they submit to this really, I think, uh, unconstitutional, unnecessary interference in the business of their individual families. And they go out and they get a business license. Yeah, I see where you're going with that, but I think there's a di- very distinct difference between a church and an individual that owns a business. I think a church that gets a 501c3 status is basically compromising with the state, saying, we will obey. There's no difference then. I mean, we look at places like China, the Soviet Union, all that, and we say, well, look at how horrible they were to the Christians, and they were highly regulated, blah, blah, blah. They could only preach what they were told they could preach. You know, the, the sermons had to be state-sanctioned. Well, there's no difference. No, oh, there's a big difference. There, the 501c3 here in Alaska doesn't require any kind of state oversight over what, the content. But the church is still compromising by saying that they'll get that 501c3 status to incorporate into a church. In order to get the tax exemption. That's what you're I'm, I'm trying to... The churches, you're asking for the state's permission. I'm saying that I Can think you, there are churches that don't this. have the 501c3s that don't pay a tax. I've read about them, and the the IRS doesn't bother them. They don't do anything to them. There are also, I mean, I guess part of it is when you start acquiring property as a church. That that I mean, because you, you can go out and you can have a church and not own any property and not get any tax exemptions because there's nothing to pay property. There's nothing to pay tax on. I mean, that's the whole issue here in Alaska. The issue is property tax. In the lower 48, the issue is income tax. Maybe they should rent. I don't know. I don't know. I think that it's just. Uh, and I think where Brent's going with it, too, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's a slippery slope of compromise in my mind well, with, I mean, with, but the, with the church. I mean, the church, above all, should not compromise. We, they never did before. I mean, well, they always have, but there, you can see there are certain times when the church just flat out said, no, you may not. You shall not pass. Mm-hmm. And they stood up, and they weren't massacred, at least not in this country, usually, sometimes. Well, I, I guess... And, I understand what you're saying completely, but I am pretty sure, I know I've read about churches that do not have 501c3s, and they are not bothered. They don't pay taxes. 
I guess. Uh, and they've I, gone to court. Over I, it. I would just say that's. I would advise not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Uh, especially on this issue, because when it comes to filling out a piece of paper to claim a tax exemption, I think there's a big difference between that and signing a pledge of allegiance. Oh, there's a huge. Or, or requiring your members mm-hmm. to to uh, submit to state oversight. I think there's a big difference there, and you know some of the things that have been talked about today. You know, in terms of the uh, interference of of the state into church business in places like Germany, requiring an oath of fidelity to uh, right a, or in ca- in Castro's Cuba right the same thing. the German church has uh-huh. actually said that Hitler was Christ Christ instrument at okay. the time and stuff. I just I guess what I'm saying is that originally when this first came up, the Christian church should have said no. Because it didn't happen until after 501c3s aren't like something that was enshrined in the Constitution. It hasn't been since day one. Well, and, and really though, if you think about it that way, the the state should have no authority to tax a church at all. Absolutely not. Absolutely. So where does it when where does the government starts taxing the church, then what is the church supposed to do? Stand up and say no, you shall not tax me. Yep. Well, what about pay, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Okay. Yes. All right. Let's um, get after that one. Four five eight oh, talk is the, the number. We're at the break here at the bottom of the hour, and we've got uh, some phone calls still coming in. Four five eight talk. If you'd like to get in queue, we have one line currently open. You got to hurry. You can also jump at the chat room, kfar 660com And welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we are streaming live around the world. I'm Steve Floyd, the man. Behind the machine, just pushing the buttons today. Uh, the real powerhouse of the program is Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises and his brother Aaron. Good morning, gentlemen. Power. <laughs> Are you still there, Aaron? Yeah, I'm here. All right, good. I haven't heard from you in the last like five minutes or so. Yeah, um, Mark 15 through 18. Um, shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is this image and subscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Okay, let's get after that. So, you had these Pharisees, politicians, who were trying to trick Jesus. Basically, what they were trying to do was say, if Jesus said that uh, don't pay your taxes, then aha, political heretic. Caesar soldiers could arrest him and throw him in jail. If he says that, you yeah, know, the, or, yes, you, you should, should pay your taxes to Caesar, then he loses legitimacy as a rabbi, teacher, or whatever, because the Jews are like, what? We don't render to Caesar. So they think they got him in a box. They tricked Jesus into... In Coincidentally, the Sadducees... Um, immediately as soon as he answered that question they were all marveling out of the Sadducees came up with their boxed question <laughs> right after that if you were to continue on but go ahead yeah okay so what did he ask for he said well show me a coin okay he didn't pull anything out of his pocket or Judas's little bag of money he goes show me a coin so the Pharisee pulls out his coin now remi- remind you they're in the temple when this is going on so the Pharisee pulls out a coin with a graven image of it on it a god oh, snap. named Caesar. In fact, on the inscription, let's see, I'm going to find this real quick because I've read this before. On the inscription, it says that, Tiberius uh, Caesar Divinity Augustus Philip Augustus means Tiberius Caesar, worshipful, worshipful son of God, Augustus. And on the other side of the coin, it said high priest. So, you have these Pharisees which God said, thou shalt have no graven images, and you shall worship no other gods before me. You shall not have images of other gods, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Pharisee pulls out a coin with a graven image of it, of another god, of a high priest. So right off the bat, that was huge. Right off the bat, the people say, well, wait a minute here. Mr. Pharisee, are you rendering to Caesar? The other part of it is this coin was actually a... Caesar's taxable coin. This was the coin that was used... Just like any money, a Federal Reserve note. Right. It was used for taxable purposes. That's what it was for. The Jews had other money, gold and silver, that were not just this, just the uh, 
Caesar's coin. Right, the there's, other, there's other mediums of exchange at right. the time. Mm-hmm. So Jesus says, okay, that's his coin. Render unto Caesar's what's Caesar's. Well, that was obviously Caesar's coin. It has his name on it. It is. It was literally Caesar owns the money. He claimed ownership to the money. So, but Caesar also claimed ownership of the people. And he struck that coin too. So he gave it. Says, give it to Caesar what's Caesar, and give unto God's what is God's. So they marveled at that. But they. But you have to think about what is Caesar's and what is God's then. God said that He was the owner of all the silver and gold. So did Caesar actually owe it? Own it? Was they, even that coin Caesar's? Another did thing, he actually say, pay your taxes? He just said, render to Caesar with Caesar's. But what, him being God, what does he claim ownership of? Everything. Yeah, look at the look at the coin at the time. If you talk about gold and silver, the coin at the time of um, Christ. Um, it was already walking diluted, earth, wasn't it? It was beyond diluted at that time. No, not until Nero. Hmm. But it was pretty stable coin. Until Nero, he was the one that debased it. He was the first one? He was the one that really got after it. Yeah, up to that point, though, it had been debased more by shaving. Right. Uh, than taking pieces off the side, or the, yep. scraping a little bit around the edge. In it wasn't terms of actually the actual melted down. Collecting up the coins and melting it down and adding in. And mm-hmm. That's something that got into the, lower, the uh, later part. And we got really bad toward the fall of Rome. It wasn't even uh, any precious metal Less than at 1%. All. Yeah. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's like our money. You reach into your pocket and pull out a quarter or a dime. Does it have any real value? If I have Canadian quarters. I mean, doesn't it actually cost more to print, to, to make our, our coins than they're worth? Oh, I see some eyebrows raising. All right. We've got some lines still on hold. I was just uh, reading something here about it. Basically, one person makes a point here. He says, if everything that was God's was rendered up to, unto God, there'd be nothing left to give Caesar. Four, I mean, five. you have to take the whole context. He says, give unto God with God and Caesar with Caesar's. God claims the land. He told the Israelites, this is my land. You're just sojourners, sojourners here. You, you just happen to be living in my space. This is my land. He said, I own the cattle of a thousand hills. I own all the gold and the silver. So give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and God what is God's. So now you have to decide which one is your God. And you don't see Jesus pulling out any money and giving it to Caesar. In fact, you didn't even see Jesus pull, Jesus pull out any money to pay the temple tax. That was another part when they said, well, does your master pay the, pay the temple tax? And the disciples were like, oh, well, of course he does. Of course he does. Uh-huh. We do everything that's right. Huh. And then they go over and say, Jesus, do we pay the temple tax? And he's like, see, boneheads, why? Why did you send me here? Please. <laughs> Scotty, beat me up. And he says, well, no, we don't pay the temple tax. But since you open your fat mouth, go down to the shore, cast out your net, and the first fish that you get, pull the coin out of the mouth, and go pay it one time. He didn't say, Judas, open the bag, take a coin, go pay it. So we can't ever see where Jesus paid taxes or even said it was right or authorized. 458 Talk, the number. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? We answered everyone's questions. This is me. Okay. Except for AIDS. This is uh, me. Abe Froman, me. Sausage King of Chicago. Yeah, I am man. me. I am I. No, I think only one person could say that one. Oh, my Thank goodness. Thank you. Wow. I, uh, I'm really, really happy with the show this morning uh, because it touches on a topic that I think endears most to me, and that's people who uh, claim to be followers of Christ and call themselves Christians and at the same time are uh, serving a completely different uh, form of government than they agree to. And uh, I think I said this before. I can only claim allegiance to one to one nation, and that is uh, the nation of my king, and that is the nation of God. And uh, I'm sure I just labeled myself right there, but um, I really think it's super important for anybody who says, hey, I'm a Christian and I go to church to really look at everything that has been talked about on this program this morning. Um, I mean, if you really are going to call yourself a Christian, and at the same time, you know, sh- shove your 
your righteousness down other people's throats at the barrel of a gun or at the threat of a nuke uh, is a something to think about. Um, I think I was going to say something else because we were texting back and forth and I now completely forgot it. Well, I'll go back to uh, just to reemphasize this thing with Caesar, running under Caesar. What, when Jesus said that, he threw it back at the Pharisees and said, basically, so they had to answer the question, what is Caesar's and what is God's? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have all the people standing around there going, hmm. So, I mean, you have to look at the context. These things weren't like, Pharisees didn't an ask these questions and stuff because in the secret meeting or whatever, they always made sure they had a good honking crowd. There's always a good crowd going on. And people are out there going, yeah, yeah, Jesus, answer that one. <laughs> they got him this time. Oh, he's going down. Render to Caesar what Caesar's. Kind of like what happens on this God. show. <laughs> yeah, very similar. Actually. I think I think it's I think it's also interesting uh, in 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 that question. You know, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, and render unto God what's God's. I I actually almost take that to say that he's literally asking them yet again, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. I mean, if you're going to mm -hmm. serve Caesar, just do it. I mean, come on, guys, you, you are you're you're all being really really you know double double sided here. So. If you're going to ask me the question whether you pay taxes or not, just do it. I mean, you guys have already chosen which law you're going to abide by. So thanks for trying to trip me up here on this question. I, 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 and that's really how I view it. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's literally asking them again, saying, look, fine, you can ask me all kinds of questions. You guys have already made up your mind in your, you know, so, so, so just do it. And it's kind of like we were talking at lunch the other day, and Ben brought it up, you know I mean? When the Pharisee pulls out the coin in the first place, I mean, he's already corrupted. Him. I mean, he's already shown himself to be corrupted by serving another idol. And so Jesus is literally pointing him in the face, saying, "Fine, you want to serve another idol? You're you're holding it right there in your hand. So, do it." So then, what, how would you answer Abe, somebody who is has used a passage like that to try to encourage Christians to pay their taxes? Well, I think. I mean, I honestly think that if you're going to be a Christian and say, "Hey, I'm going to church," and uh, all these things, and at the same time, I'm also getting involved in politics. I'm voting, and all these other things. I mean, I I think that you're that it's a that it's a two faced thing. And uh, sh and if you're going to pay your tax, I mean, if you're going to get involved in voting, and if you think that America should be going around the world, you know, spreading our version of the gospel, um, then you probably should pay your taxes because you've already subscribed to the to the rest of uh, uh, to the to the rest of it. So you know, again. Choose, you can't choose two sets of laws here. I mean, you. I mean, if you're going to follow a set of morals and principles from one side and then follow a moral set of principles from the other other side, aka the government, then you're basically choosing two different masters, and you're lying to one of them. And you better figure out which one's going to, you know, going to figure out that, that that you're really lying to them. Well, one has the power to throw you in jail or to kill you. No, one of them can also strike me dead with a lightning bolt from heaven too. So I mean, sounds like either way, I can be killed. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yep. yep. All right. Four five eight talk is the number if you'd like to uh, participate in the program by phone. Uh, Josh, we got about uh, fifteen minutes here left today in the allotted time. Um, there are some deep thoughts that are going on here in so, terms of, of people. Sounds like wrestling. we need to buy another hour. <laughs> I'm a think, capitalist. I'll go for that. I was sure. thinking back on the five hundred one c three issue. And I understand the tax issue and that, but uh, what about to maintain your 501c3, you are restricted in what things you can talk about. Yeah, you, you definitely have to abstain from anything political. Well, you know what? There are some of us who abstain from anything political on a matter of principle anyway. <laughs> you know that's not the same correlation, though. Yeah, it's you basically can't even preach out against politics. You can't talk politics at all, even to say it's evil and corrupt. I don't think. Hmm. Well, that, that's I don't no. I, people had to forgo their 501c3 for a day just to tell people that they should vote for Mitt Romney. You definitely can't go the other way. Well, that, that's the whole point, though. <laughs> that Glenn Beck was behind that, that issue was that, that they were they trying didn't. to provoke a fight because the IRS hasn't actually pursued anybody right. for speaking out from the pulpit. They I haven't. think the motivation was more to get Mitt Romney voted in. Sure, even though they didn't actually say that. Right. I mean, they made it very clear they weren't going to tell you exactly to vote for Mitt Romney, but they were going to play 2016 in the church. Mm. And they were going <laughs> to talk about the party of God. The G. The, wait. the GOP. No, that, that would be P.O.G. Oh. <laughs> I like P.O.D. Or, or Hezbollah, you know, like I said in Arabic. God's party own party, God. the GOP. Hmm. 
if there's any difference between an American terrorist and an Arab terrorist. Depends on... Yeah, because American terrorists are anarchists and Arab terrorists are um, Islamo-fascists. Well, well, I mean, wait, they're the wait, same thing. When was the thing? last time Glenn you heard Beck about an American me. anarchist actually carrying out any acts of violence? As opposed to how many how many people that are wearing costumes are carrying well, out acts of violence? They've there? tried, but the FBI stopped them right before they let off the bomb that the FBI gave them. The FBI is the one that gave them the bomb. The FBI is the one that gave them the plot. The FBI is the one that entra- well, you gave know, them the target. There used to be something called entrapment. Apparently yeah, that doesn't anymore. actually apply anymore. Now, if, if if somebody can trick you into doing something, you can be sent into jail for doing what they tricked you into doing. Oh, well, there used to be something called the Fourth Amendment, too. But yeah, that There used to be something called the Second Amendment, too. And the Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth. There used to be something called the Constitution. There used to be something called the First Amendment, even. There used to be something called common sense. Oh! <laughs> wow. It's piping up there. That's it's, at uh, four to six on your weekday drive home on KFAR. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sean Andy? No, no. He's talking about how... Oh, common sense radio. Mm-hmm. By the way, anybody who didn't recognize the voice, that was one of the Bennett Spawn and Israel. Thanks for being here today. Using his mind again. Wow. Common uh, sense. Who You're going to have to go sit outside. <laughs> uh, a, now, I understand. Don't you have to have a permit for thinking? You yeah, should. These days? I mean... Uh, no, just for preaching. Uh, I'd like to buy some of those permits, actually, and give them to people so they would think. <laughs> Thinking. You already... Okay. We're digressing terribly we're now. Just, uh, we're going off the rail. We're right here, here on the says, 10 minutes at the end of the show, scratching our heads <laughs> and picking our noses. Oh, oh well, okay. I've got I've got something I'd like to know where you guys are, are fall on this issue here. I, I put it away to the side just to bring it up if I possibly could today. And that is what's going on with the TSA moving those body scanners away from the big airports. You know, everybody was screaming and hollering about them when they first came out, so they said, Okay, fine, you don't want the you don't want us to look at you naked, we'll just strip you naked and touch your body. And now they're moving those away from the big airports and putting them in the small airports. Um I read recently, too, that they are now at the different railways, bus transits, and the uh, subways. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really taking to heart that they are the Transportation Security, Security Administration. Administration. Well, I think that um, the answer to that's pretty simple. It's the same argument for being um, a one-world government globalist. It, being the same argue, argument as being a minarchist or a, a limited government type. I actually saw that uh, they changed their name from Transport- Transportation Security Administration to the Sexual um, Assault yeah. Assailants. <laughs> sexual assault. TSA. Uh, well, it isn't really part of the problem here is that, that instead of relying on the rule of law, like this little pamphlet right here used to be called the Constitution, you know, that, that all those amendments and all that that we were talking about, having enshrined that the government shall not pass any law that's going to restrict your right to free speech. Mm-hmm. They're not going to pass any law that's going to restrict your, your right to practice a religion of your choice. They're or not re- going to pass any law to restrict your access to firearms. They're not going to pass any law that's going to re- require you to give up your security and your personhood or require you to produce papers at a moment's notice anywhere that they choose to stop you. Any of these... That that basically has been turned into a joke because we now have the ability to make law out of nothing. You see this? You see this story in my hand? Florida town passes saggy pants ban. They have now made it illegal, illegal to wear saggy pants in Florida. Thank God that they are keeping us safe. By pulling from up from the soggy bottom boys. <laughs> <laughs> that would be saggy bottom boys. Uh, yeah, I mean, isn't that part of, really part of the whole problem is that we have somehow given this power of God to man in terms of the ability to make law? Absolutely. That is it. The absolute bottom line is we're in our um, legislated free entry form of government, we were given this ultimate gift to create law. I mean, it used to be. So it, it, well, any argument, any argument for a smaller government is just redonkulous. There is no argument for that. You're, you're same argument for... It's impossible. Right. For this limited government, it, it's the same... 
Your argument for having that limit, that amount of government, whether it's limited or not, is the same argument for having a global, one-world government. It, or, or having limited rape or limited murder. I, I believe in... Right. If, if there is any form of government that is, is the right amount, then any bigger size of that is a better amount. I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, it, didn't it used to be that people would discover the law behind something? I mean, it's kind of like the whole natural law discussion that we've had before. Yeah, well, what is the law that governs the relationship between people? What is, and you have to you have to pursue it and discover it just like you would pursue the natural law of what is it that causes an apple to fall out of the tree? Well, we call that the law of gravity. Gravite. We can't go and make a new law by popular vote that we're going to change the law of gravity so that certain items fall up instead of down, can we? No. I wouldn't surprise me if they tried. Well, actually, they have. Guam. Thank you for bringing that up. There's actually this is a, a town in Indiana that passed a law forbidding the river to rise. Did it obey? I'm not sure. If it knew it was good for it, it would have. <laughs> That's going to be hard to throw that I one I wonder in if jail. they tax it for its water to be able to fund for enforcing that law. Well, that all depends on if they own it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jeremiah. Uh, we're not going there. No matter how much you try. You guys are shaking your heads like you're just uh, deep in thought here. I'm still stuck on the soggy bottom, boys. That's just re- <laughs> Me too. What, great. what happens if you disobey that absurd law? If you disobey that absurd law, let me read it to you here. On A Florida city council said an ordinance that could result in saggy pants wearers being fined will not take effect until next year so that the community can be informed. On Tuesday, the Cocoa City Council voted 3-1 to one in favor of the ordinance. It imposes a $25 fine on wearers of saggy pants who previously received verbal warnings. They should have made a law against skinny pants because those are the ones that really are an eyesore. Councilman Clarence Whipple, the sole opposing vote on the ordinance said he sought to postpone voting on the ordinance after residents raised concerns about profiling and selective enforcement. His motion was not seconded. Therefore, he says, we need to make sure our Cocoa Police Department enforces this ordinance in all the districts. I'm asking that we educate the public prior to adopting this ordinance. And therefore, they voted to delay the enforcement until January 1st so that the public will be educated about the new rules before fines are imposed. So, I the bet they're one conservatives. vote against sure. it. Like Here, here's the question though: is is that is that enforcement any different than any other enforcement? Absolutely not. When they came for the when they came for the saggy pants people, I didn't object because I didn't wear saggy. You pants. You wore skinny jeans. <laughs> you, I don't know. Well, it, it, the, the, what is the principle behind it? That that they have the right to make this law. Even the one person who opposed it. Wasn't it opposing it on the principle that this is an asinine law? Sure, I got or that. Or that this is a ridiculous... He was opposing it because he was afraid that you're only going to selectively enforce this. You weren't going to make sure everybody didn't wear saggy and bottom boy pants. We need pants. to make sure we need to give time for people to know that we are changing the law. Just like if we were going to change the law of gravity. We're going to have to make sure that we give people time to know that if they trip, they no longer have to fall down. But instead, they have to fall up. Even better, they're required to fall up. That's or right. they get fined. They'll be fine. So do you think all the skinny jeans guys are going to stand up for the soggy bottom boys because they're going to be next? No. Maybe That's why government. I said when they came for the saggy mm-hmm. bottom boys. I didn't say anything because I weren't Maybe the government's jeans. trying to play the role of God, telling the river what to do. Maybe the government already is what? God. In their minds. And if we, no, and you know, I, I was accused this week of preaching a false religion. Because I told people that they should not submit to everything the government tells them to do. Right, but isn't my point is isn't the argument for any of those even to argue that there should be that ordinance shouldn't stand is the same as saying that we should have a global government. Mm-hmm. You're either you're either for it or against it. Any argument you have for a, a minimal amount of that. 
can obviously be used for a maximum amount. It reminds me of the absurdity of when the police chief was on the radio with uh, Vivian Stiver talking about their uh, quota law, and that quota is not a quota. And and I quote. Yeah. And the silliness of when he said, well, look, you, st- you still have to have cause to pull you over. The police officer just can't pull you over for no reason. He has to have cause. That's silly. Everybody knows that there, are, there are, are so many laws right now on the books that it is impossible, but the, impossible for you to drive three blocks without giving a policeman cause. But the fact that he even tried to bring that up and tried to make that make make it a, a sound argument because, well, you still have to have cause to pull you over. Well, how many causes are there? There's thousands of them. Thousands of reasons why he can pull you over. And that's over. just here in little old Square Banks, Alaska. Right. So it's just silly. And now, in Florida, another reason you can get pulled over. You're wearing saggy pants. Gosh, that's stupid. I think we should, uh, I would suggest- lobby for a law here against skinny pants. Because the saggy pants thing's kind of out of style. Here. You know what? I think the real problem here is pants, and I would like to go pants free. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> no, not right no. now. Steve, Jeez. sit down. Sit down. Wow. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> I'm blind. Help me. Uh, oh, is this show over? <laughs> For anyone who does not know, I actually did. Just Steve is pantless right don't now. My pants off. Where are the cops? I am doing this in solidarity with all of my saggy... I am starting, bottom. I'm starting to agree with the motivation behind <laughs> regulating people's pants. <laughs> you know, there is some legitimacy. People come along and finally you have to agree with the state. Yep. <laughs> Certain things you go, yep. Steve, you win. We're all stated. All right, then. No, that's a private property issue, actually, because he just violated my eyeballs. <laughs> All right. Gosh. You know I'm going to sue for ongoing damages of the image that's burnt into my skull candy. I don't think we're going to post this show. <laughs> Good thing we don't do a video feed. <laughs> no, if we had done the video feed, I would have gone further because I would be encouraged oh. in my anarchic... Uh, you know, um, tendencies here to reject the I status I think in this flow. certain case, we need to be minarchists. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to get rid of the anarchists. <laughs> Do you want to get rid of me? Because now I know why they want oh, to get rid yeah, of the yeah, anarchists. Because you know what? If we allowed them to even exist, then all of a sudden that, that thought would grow and people would start taking their pants off everywhere. I know I would. I already came in my pajamas. You just had an opportunity to take your pants off. He's not Inside. wearing pants. He's wearing pajamas. <laughs> Ooh, there's a violation. I like to sleep in between um, breaks. So. I think you like to sleep sometimes while we're still on the air. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got less than a minute to go. Quick uh, contact information. PatriotsLament.blogspot.com is the website. PatriotsLament at gmail.com is the email, and Radio Free Fairbanks is the YouTube channel. And we've got Lou Rockwell and Bob Murphy up on there, which are actual good shows. Versus the last 15 oh, minutes. Oh, come on. Here. This has been priceless. This is a gem. And on, and on 660, you can get into the archives pretty you easily. You can, in fact, yeah. Yeah, we appreciate the calls. There's some... Everyone had... Uh, even Randy, we actually had a conversation with him. That's All great. right. Okay. See you next week. <laughs>